Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Eric Murray. Eric, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. G'day, man. How are you? Good to be here. I'm going to start off with something that came to me earlier today. And I was curious to know that when you were a kid and you heard the nursery rhyme, row, row, row your boat gently <laughs> down the stream, that you just turned around and went, fuck you. No, mate, I was like literally every other kid in New Zealand and you wanted to be an all black, okay? And it's just, it's what you grew up doing. You know, you might play a bit of football or something. I grew up as a kid. It was rugby, it was cricket, you know, summer sports. And I was always into sports, did everything I could. Um, and then in high school, I started figuring that I was actually better at rowing than I was at rugby. So I was like, well, actually, if I want to be like the top in the world or like be the top in New Zealand, maybe I'm not going to do it at rugby. Um, and the rowing sort of led me along that path. And that's basically how you get stuck into it. And then from there, it's just like a journey that you take a shit ton of paths on and, and hopefully you get some rewards at the end of it. Well, we'll get into this, but you have about the most prolific rowing career I've ever even heard of, let alone... <laughs> Like, I've got nothing to compare it to. And I'm curious to know, what's more painful, in your opinion, giving birth oh. or going flat out <laughs> for two kilometres with a mate? No, it's, it's got to be shit. No, it's, it's got to be the rain. No, no, no. <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely giving birth. I'm not going to go there. Um, yeah, oh, it's a really hard thing to describe. Eh? And... Um, when you try and talk to people about like, oh, you know, and, and the best way to describe it is you get people that go to the gym and they jump on the rowing machine. And of course, a lot of people are like, oh, that bloody machine, yeah, it's so bloody hard. And you go, well, imagine doing that at this speed for this time. And people are just like, oh, holy shit, okay. And that's the level of what you've got to go to. And of course, it just, it almost begs belief because you have to train to that point and put you in that position every single day and a lot of people don't realize that rowing for us, even though we won a whole lot of stuff, but every day in training, we were just trying to fail. Like we were trying to lose. We were trying to go out too hard. We were trying to like hold numbers that we couldn't hold or try and keep up with a crew that was way faster than us. And we tried to do that every single day and put the pain on you every single day so that when I get to the Olympics, <laughs> which I sort of hate saying, is the Olympic race wouldn't have even been in the top 10 of our hardest physical races that we've ever had to do. And it should be. It should be your hardest pinnacle. This is it. This is the World Cup rugby final. Everything relies on this one race you've got to do. And it's going to be the hardest thing you ever do in your life. We got to it and we were like, hey, we won the gold. I could have probably gone and done another race. You know, but, and, that, and that's what we did uh, through all of the different people in our career to get us to that point. So that training was basically harder than competition. And that's where all our pain came every single day. So going right back to your question, shit, at a one-off, oh, mate, childbirth. Because <laughs> you're a dad? Yeah. What are some of the attributes that you are trying to pass on to your next generation? Yeah, to my son. Well, see, Zach, um, Zach's autistic. And so he has a big communication difficulty. So luckily enough, in everything that I've done, um, I'm actually patron for Autism New Zealand. So I, I get to really help out and try and make a difference. So with awesome. the, yeah, so the positions that you get put in uh, because of what we've done and we've won Olympic gold medals of the country and it's historic and all the other bits and pieces is where I was talking before to those kids, you're always giving back and you're always doing something. So for me, Zach being autistic and finding out ways to, for better treatment, um, to better education, all this sort of stuff, you go right at the forefront of it. Um, and I'm just lucky enough that I've got what I've done to be able to help that. So uh, at the moment, we just are out there with him every day, just doing all his education, doing everything to make sure that he has the best pathway in life. Um, and so, yeah, it's really enjoyable. Uh, it's, it's awesome to hear, Eric. And, and what I suppose what's one, been one of the greatest lessons that you've had to learn about having an autistic son. Not that you want to label him with anything, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, it's just, it's just a way different way of thinking. And it's, it's really amazing because some of the top people in the world, the, some of the brightest scientists, 
um, you know, some of the best businessmen around all have attributes of autism because of either the singular focus, they just don't like other people, they just are really, really bright, you know, take Einsteins and all that sort of stuff. They're the ones that actually can change the world. Um, and so it's really nice to just be able to make sure that you're doing all the education stuff properly um, and giving them the best because some things you, you see are just like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and the whole idea is just to be able to nourish it and, and get them to understand what society thinks we need to understand. Yeah, well, it's, it's a really great initiative. And uh, I still play cricket over here, Eric, for Melbourne University. And we've, the president of the club, his wife works with autistic children. And we've been lucky enough and blessed to have some of these amazing scorers that have, they're mm. on the spectrum in some way, shape or form. They have the most beautiful handwriting, the most amazing attention to detail. <laughs> like you can have that job because I ha like I get caught up like the squirrel, um, you know, the dog chasing the squirrel, the stuff, and they just nail it. And like you just yeah. know it's one hundred percent accurate, you know. So I really love that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I just want to explore a bit more of what you were talking about earlier with regards to this learning to fail, because. I feel like we might have glossed over this a little bit and sort of how you ended up with this style of, of training. Where, where did this come from? <laughs> yeah, uh, honestly, um, it's, it's your coach, you know, you're coaching the people around you are doing everything possible to get you in a position to, to flourish and give you uh, that position to be the, the person you are. You know, our parents do it as, as, as kids. Um, you know, your CEO and your managers are trying to get you into that position to be really good at business. It happens in all different ways in life. Um, and so for us, um, shit, hang on a sec. I'll just go check something. Nah, okay, I'll be back in a sec. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's right. Sorry, just a visitor. Sorry, mate. Um, where do you want to start that one again? No, no, no. It's all right. No worries. Just continue on. We'll, we'll sort it out. Oh, okay. Um, oh, because you're going to do a cut, eh, if we have to. Do you want to rephrase? Do you want to rephrase the question and just say like, where did we get it from? Yeah, yeah. It was more around. Um, I'll just pay attention to the time. Hang on. So nineteen, eighteen. Um, so what I wanted to explore a little bit more, which I feel like we might have just glossed over it a little bit, Eric, yep. was the how you got to uh, to develop this this technique of like failing. Where did this come yep. from? Um, okay, so the the ability to fail really came from our coach. Um, and so Dick was our coach, and he's a little bit underrated, I think, a little bit, just because he was never in the limelight and that sort of stuff, and it's not like the rugby coach was like Steve in bits and pieces. He was the one that really just, um, like he's won, you know, if you look at his, his credentials and the gold medals that he's won, when you buy into his program, and so for us, for Hamish and I, we were coming out of the four, um, and, and Dick's there going, hey, I want to coach you guys in the pair, your chance and your probability of actually winning goes up. And that's what all these top coaches are. You know, you're like your rugby team gets a coach. You're like, shit, we could win the NRL this year or we could we could win the, the Super Rugby, you know, because they're so good at what they do. So we bought into what Dick was going to tell us to do. And it was horrendous. It was like, you were doing Ks that you didn't think you could possibly handle. And then he's putting you up against like a boat that's faster. And he's like on your tail going, keep up, keep up, keep up. And so we're just basically trying to push ourselves to the absolute limit every single day. Um, and we were failing. So we're trying to keep up with a, uh, like a woman's quad that was faster than us in training, like quite significantly, or the men's double. And we're trying to keep up with them. Um, and if you can do that, you just know that you're going to go into the world championships and you're going to be so much faster than anybody, even before you turn up. And that was the biggest thing that we did is by putting yourself under the pressure all the time, it really leads you on to what makes people successful is knowing what they can achieve before they go into something. So all the top athletes around the world, and it's, and it's definitely Olympic stuff, you pretty much know how you're going to go before you arrive. You know, Valerie will know that she's probably going to get top two because she's won all these competitions before, all this sort of stuff. So for us, all this back work that you do every single day, the, the punishment that you put on yourself gets you to the ability. So when you walk into the big, like for us, the world champs or a world cup final, 
we'd go, you know what? I pretty, I'm pretty sure we can win this today because we did these pieces the other day that were like just above world record speed. And you go, shit, if anyone else can actually keep up with us, they're probably going to be going really fast. But of course, nobody was just going as fast as what we were. And we just kept pushing that boundary and pushing that limit all the time. Because even though we were winning some of our races by a bloody country mile, Dick would just get into training the next day, like, and hammer us. And it was just like, fuck. And so it wasn't a really pleasant experience. <laughs> but, the outcome, but the outcome at the end of it is like you win a gold medal. And I don't know, there's a lot of people that would trade a lot to get that ability to just go under a person and know that, shit, if I do what he tells me to do for the next three years, I'm probably going to win an Olympic gold medal. You know, because that was the history. You had Rob winning. You had the Twins win twice. You had Mahe getting bronze. Then you got me and Mahe, you know, so us and Mahe and the, like, women that have come through afterwards. And you go, holy shit, like, this guy can take something and just turn it into it as long as you do what you're told to do. Um, very old school method of, of teaching, right? But the fact was that that is what has won so many rowing gold medals is because of just that ability to just push people to as hard as they think they can do it. And that is what happened to us. See, I, I, I think the, the overwhelming attitude, certainly living in Australia for the last, or well, half my life now, Eric, for nearly 20 years, depending on what code you're talking about, whether it be cricket, AFL, rugby, rugby league over here, there's a lot of injury management stuff that they're doing. So they're quite fearful of uh, pushing yourself to breaking point in, in lots of different areas, which is, I suppose, understandable. But I'm a bit like, I, I like that that theory that you're, that, well, it's not a theory, it's fucking work, right? But it, it's, um, as an ultra runner, which I've only started doing in the last two years, I got an I did an IT band injury on my first run at, at halfway in a hundred K run. And it was uh, the century surf coast over here. It was one of the coldest weekends on history and on record. They had um, about 2,200 meters of elevation and, you know, like it was brutal. I had the wrong shoes and, and I, I hobbled for 50 kilometers and I finished it. And then and I, and I read David Goggins' book and he was talking about, you know, when you, you've still got 40% left when you think you're absolutely done. And I, and I, that was case in point for me. So I love that pushing, that pushing scenario that you're talking about. Yeah, I, it's one thing that I just, and a lot of it's been hindsight and it is looking back and just going like, how the fuck did we actually do it? Because at the time, you're just thinking short-term, long-term, medium, short-term goals. And those goals are get fit, get fast, you know, make the team, um, go to the first World Cup, try and win that, go to the second one. Okay, how do we do it? How many Ks this week? Um, how many weight sessions? How many bikes are we doing? How many ergs? How, how intense are they? So the whole program and what we did is just registered literally in reverse. So we, like, they plan. They don't go, oh, we'll do this this month, like working up. They go, right, here's race day, seven days out. 10 days out 21 days out and it's all calculated it's amazing how like the programs big sporting environments for the people that are actually winning like because there's a lot of public money invested in it at the same time right so all of these people are justifying what they're doing and all the money that's coming in but it actually is turning sport and this is why it's so high performance into what it is today because you've got so much resource going into it and so many people with so many expertise to basically use us, I love using the word, as like a lab rat, because they go, we're going to push Eric to this limit, we're going to set him this training program, and we're going to see if he can break it, because if you take a really good athlete and you're trying to do it, so sometimes, and that's, this is so outside the box, but when you take the Rocky movie, Rocky Five, I know, which one's Rocky with Dolph? It's Rocky, the first one, right? And he's fighting him. I think so. No, Rocky You're five. testing is my Rocky memory five? now. This is early 80s. <laughs> okay, so the whole, the whole thing, though, is that he's a machine that gets put on by the German government to bloody fight, and Rocky's this huge legend, and he's going to fight him. He's going to break him because he's trained so much harder than anyone else. That was basically, that's what sport is at high performance level. And, and a lot of people don't, when you buy into it, you don't really see that when to be the best in the world, You've got to knock off everybody else that's below you to make sure that you're at the top. Okay? You knock off a lot of people on the way. 
And so those people come out with a negative attitude towards like how it works and different bits and pieces. So there's a whole lot that comes with it, but, but you are just trying to get to that point and you just got to do everything that all of these people tell you to do. And in the end of it, you get the Kathy Freemans, you get the Rob Waddells, you get um, the Usain Bolts and all of this, because that's just as hard as you can push a human being in that sport, that position. And they're going to come out of the end of it with something bloody special and a, and a bloody gold medal. Well, I'd love to. I'd love to know what uh, some of the unexpected benefits of being a such a prolific champion in the sport of rowing, like outside of the recognition in the streets. What some of the? And I'm not talking about having your your, your happy meal upgraded at McDonald's. What are some? Of, what's some of the good stuff? Oh, it's as I said before. It's you've got to be able to give back, and you've got to be able to help out. Um, and so like I do like talking to other athletes and, and just give them some advice because I learned so much along the way of, of how we did things and what worked and what didn't. And then ultimately to be, you know, because a lot of people don't see that I was in the team for like six, seven years before anything comes, you know, your development, you're not even making the elite, you're on a list and it takes you that long to get actually in the world and start winning medals. So it's this whole process getting through there is just, um, it's really amazing to actually think about how long it actually takes for you to get into that position. But so, you know, yeah, with all of that, um, you know, once you, once you are successful, if you can help the other young athletes out to it quicker, um, it's really good. You know, you talk to schools because everybody knows the Olympic programs, bits and pieces. Um, but, and as a matter of fact, you know, you're just going to try, and do as much as you can for the people that have supported you along the way. Um, and you have done something pretty special, you know, and people know who you are, they know what you've done. Um, and so if you can use it to, for different events, different fundraising things, as I say, I work with a couple of charities some trusts, um, you we all love to see success, you know, and if you can help someone else be successful, then there's always that little part of you that's gonna be like, you know what, I help them do that. Um, and that's what happens with coaches. That's what happens with all the, the support staff around it because they know they've had that little piece in winning that medal. It wasn't just the person that went out and did it. It's actually quite a big group of people. And then that falls down to the people that watch it. They loved it. They see the memories. It does become part of sporting history. Um, and it's just part of our life. It's part of our culture. You know, it's part of 82, you know, uh, and then like Rugby World Cup 86, you know, and you just go through all the stuff. And everybody remembers the Munich Eight, you know, like all the different bits and pieces, all the sporting histories that have happened in the world, you know, when Team New Zealand won the first America's Cup, you know, all that sort of stuff. That's really big parts of history. And you actually become one of those. And you've got to, you've got to know that if you do become successful, then that's just what happens. Um, and if you don't want that, then don't be successful. <laughs> so it does, it, and it actually does, you know, and it really does. It's like famous people, they go, oh man, I'd love to be rich and famous. And then they're whinging when you've got a camera in your face and you go, like, you knew what was going to happen before you went in there. You know, if you become the All Black captain, everyone's going to want to talk to you. If you don't want that to happen, don't be the All Black captain. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it, but it is. And it's just the way that you have to accept going into it, that what you're actually trying to achieve is something that hardly anyone's ever done before. Um, uh, very few people get the opportunity at, but there's a lot of people that would love to see it happen. Um, and that's what we feel like, that's what I feel really privileged about at the same time. Well, I wanna explore the genesis because behind some of these extraordinary athletes and coaches that I've been so privileged to have on the show, we had Sir Steve Hansen came on, we had Justin Langer, who's the current Australian cricket coach, had Ryan Harris, the, the Australian fast bowler, Chris Rogers, all have experienced, you know, certain um, amazing stuff in their life. We had uh, Gavin Larson come on as well, which was a real thrill, you know, to try and balance it out. But what about, where did you get this, this drive? Like what was childhood like for you and where did you get this from? Oh, I don't know. I was just a kid that, you know, when you grow up in the late 80s, early 90s, it was just sport, you know, mum and dad, you know, dad probably shouldn't he might have still played rugby when I was first born, you know, it's just, it's what they did. And it was just part of the sport. And then um, ultimately, yeah, from that, um, I was just always as a kid, just playing sport, just was fully energetic. Um, we lived in Bombay and my parents said I was always on my bike and I was just every afternoon, 
there was no sit down, watch TV. It was like, right, go get on your bike and ride around and just like, and do stuff, make some jumps and go outside. Uh, and then basically, I think from all of that, I just love the competition of it. Uh, and then, as you say, you just walk through the process of just growing up, still continuing to play and then just actually wanting to be the best at it. Um, and that's really just where the drive comes from, is just trying to be the best all the time. And that's that's where it starts. It's It, it seems like an accidental blessing, I think, Eric, because a, a lot of people, I, um, this is a question I ask a lot of my guests, and not, like it usually comes from a pivotal moment, like an inspirational parent or a, you know, a mentor. Um, you know, we had Pat Scammell on, who's an Australian middle distance runner. He never won a medal at the Olympics, um, but he set the record in Australia, in Australia, at least for the most amount of sub four minute miles. It's like 18 of them. I don't know if you've ever tried to run that fast, um, but it's pretty brutal. I know you <laughs> rode that fast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which man. Is, which crazy. is unbelievable. Um, and so it's just, it's really interesting. And and maybe it's just a case where you just grew up in, in the right place at the right so, time. Yeah. And, and the one thing with rowing in New Zealand as well is that it wasn't, was it, it was there. There was a lot of people sort of still doing it and there was a community of people that did it. Um, and you just had to get someone in the club because that was, you know, the old sporting club. They used to be really big. They used to have a lot of people. Um, and then, of course, it just started wienering down. And then all of a sudden, someone at the school will just like ignite the club. And then all of a sudden, there's just people like inviting you to come and do it. And you just try it. And then you just go from there. So um, I was trying to be good at rugby at school. And I was trying to be in the first, you know, cricket team. And so as a kid, you're trying to make all of these teams. And you just keep trying to be the best. And then you find a sport that you're actually really good at. And you're still trying to be the best all the time. So you know, it took us a couple of years, but when you actually start winning races, you go, man, this is actually really good, you know, because this is what I've been doing all the work for, and you win the races, and it's it's a buzz, it's a real massive buzz, and then you go, shit, I want to do that again, and I want to go faster, and maybe I could do that on a national level, and then you commit yourself to try and be in a team that's going to win the national champs, and then now you're a national champion, and so you're the best in the country, you know, and so it just keeps steamrolling into this ability for always that betterment to try and be uh, get more accolades to win more, to get to the absolute top that you can, because everybody's trying to do it. Usain Bolt is trying to run the fastest time in the world. And all the other guys are trying to do it. Every other runner, every other swimmer, you get to a point where you're like, am I just going to stop at winning it? Or am I actually going to leave my mark? And when we leave the sport, people are going to remember what we did. But you only get to that point because you just keep ticking all the boxes. You go, okay, we've won this race. We've won the world champs. Cool. We've won the Olympics. Cool. What else can we do? You know, and so you start ticking more boxes, but getting up every day and punishing yourself doesn't start looking very attractive when you're like, oh, I'm just going to fucking go do what I did last year. Even though it's amazing to win the world championships, don't, don't take me that. But what are you searching for? Like just to tick up some more numbers or should you like, you've won everything you possibly can. What do you want to do from from here? So when we were competing, the fact that we actually had this unbeaten streak that was sort of following us for our first four years and then carried on and became like the longest running one, I think, in 2013, all of a sudden you're thinking, man, imagine if we could win for another three years. Holy shit. And so all of a sudden your motivation becomes we're going to do this cycle because nobody's ever done two Olympic cycles unbeaten. You know, nobody's and many, very many people can win one Olympics and go back the following Olympics and do it. So all of these motivating factors just came in and it just really, it just drove us every single day to be the better person you can. And it does, it just, it, I found it kept growing. It wasn't one pivotal point that actually said to me, man, I just want to be like that guy. It was just this culmination of trying to be better and trying to, whatever you do, try and be the best at it. And how do you work to that? Because it doesn't happen overnight. This time, you know, where can I go from here? And it just, it puts you in the position that we got to. It's almost like completing levels on a, on a computer game, Eric, yep. isn't it? Like it's that, that, that one more level kind of thing. I, I haven't really had, had it explained in this format before. It's really interesting getting this take. 
and it's kind of like this this well, addiction. When, when the one thing it is an addiction, and this is this is a funny part because when you actually do really analyze it, and I thought about it a lot because. <laughs> You know, it's so fascinating, and I would have loved to have done like psychology. I'd love to do psychology, um, because when you actually start diving into it and and why you're actually motivated, and to get up and do it every day when like you've already done what you've done. So even you take a rugby team and they go, okay, I'm in the Super 15 team. We've won a couple of titles. I'm in the All Blacks. Now what are you doing? Are you just playing for the next game, or are you playing for like a legacy, or are you doing like what? What's the what's the motivation? Like, okay, you're getting up and you're getting paid some good money, but everything's a finite time at the same time. So you've got to start looking at that at the same time with what we were doing in rowing, and go, well, is that another motivating factor? Is it to see how long you can carry it out, um, or are you better off now to cut your loss or to leave on top, and then work into your business or whatever you were doing outside of it? And get a step out because the whole finishing of sport and going into jobs, we know there is a big issue and it's very easy for successful people, but people that aren't quite so successful or have dedicated their life for it, it can be a bit rough. Um, and so those are the questions that you're always putting on yourself when you just commit to do it. It sounds like you've, you've done a lot of work around goal setting. Was that off your own back or was it something that was taught to you at a young age? Uh, a little bit at a young age, like the goal setting side, it really starts getting taught for you though. Okay. So this will sound sort of pretty dumb, but when, when you, you're wanting to win, okay. And so you're wanting to, you're going, this is, this is, I'm going to work backwards from Olympic games or world championships. And I'm going to work back to when we have one race, the next race, the next race, the next race. So you break it down just like the physiologists break down our training program. And you go, okay, I've got to be in a good space here and I've got to be in a good space here and I've got to be going this fast to get to here. And so you do all of that sort of stuff. And so that's in your head at the same time, but also the physiologists are feeding it to you to get you to that position because subconsciously, you know, it needs to happen, but it's not something that you've got to think about all the time because everything's getting put in place for you to actually be at that point because they do all the prep, they do all the training, they just push you as an athlete so that you get to that world championships and you win. And so that's where the goals come in, that a lot of it is really pushed right back to the daily pacing, uh, just that internal competition that you get there to try and be as good as you can be every day because the long-term goals take care of themselves. So when you talk about like, you know, everyone does talk about the short-term, mid-term, long-term goal and, and they talk about short-term. I really have looked at it over my time and realize that a short-term goal should actually be every single day. So your short-term goal, you go out there today and you go, right, we're pacing off another crew. Our goal is to fucking beat them. We want to get back to the dock before they do. And if we do any pieces against each other, we're going to be winning every single one of them. Okay? So our short-term goal was every single day. So whatever training that you got put in front of you, your goal was to either complete it or do better than what they expected of you. And that's what happens with every single athlete around the world, whether it's like rugby, netball, NFL, shit, they'd be brutal. If you just one day where you weren't on form, bang, you're cut. Do you know what I mean? And this is the cutthroat thing about sport. And we just get put in that position. But when you just go to do it, every single day is your goal. Every single day is to try and be better than you were the last day. All the other stuff takes care of themselves. Because you don't wake up one morning and go, oh man, yeah, I've got 10, oh, what have I got? 1120 days to the next Olympics. Yes, I can't <laughs> wait. You're like, you can't get motivated for that, but you can get motivated for what you're about to do right now, this morning, so that you can finish the session. Do it. If you do it really well, you walk away going, yeah, man, ah, we're on track. Or you don't do it and you've got to start thinking about what's going to make you go better. So that's your short-term goal every single day. And so that's all we thought about was whatever was put in front of us for that session or that day was, to, was put there as a test. And we had to make sure we could either complete it or better it better than what we were expected to do. And that's basically what training as an elite athlete is about. Well, I, I, I'm grateful for this insight, Eric. The closest I ever <laughs> got to greatness was... Uh, and third in the third 15 at Christchurch Boys High, which I think I probably would have played second or maybe a first 15 at a smaller school. 
But I played outside Scott Hamilton, who mm -hmm. who then became an All Black. And there it is. And, and it's one of my favourite stories. To, and I was talking to Steve Hansen about this as well, and and he was a big fan of Bubble, and uh, he just he just decided, you know, like you're saying, that this is what he was going to do. And for him to progress from third 15 rugby at boys, like amazing story, amazing yeah. story. And, uh, but I suppose the thing that I'm curious to know, Eric, is that now that you've, you've dominated the sport and you've dominated the Olympics, do you, do you find it harder now to be inspired by either non rowing elite athletes? Oh, no, we were, I've always been inspired by, um, by any other athlete. Um, and, and you just get a, oh, geez, not to be honest. No, nah, not really. Because I like anyone at the top of the game, you know, you see them on TV and you watch what they're doing and you're like, man, they're doing so well, you know, shit, they're excellent at what they do their job, right. To be the best sports person they can be. And I know the effort that I put in to be the best at the Olympics and rowing in the men's pair. Now, in their sport, they have a number that's like astronomically more than what we had in rowing. So, of course, for them to be like for us to make, you know, if you do it in percentages, you work out the percentage to be an Olympic rower. And it's not huge because there's only a few million rowers around the world, you know, and then there's only a few thousand in New Zealand. You know what you do all the numbers, whereas you take like the basketballers or the footballers and there's like two, three billion people that can actually do it. And you go, man, for you to be the best, you've got to be like doing everything exactly perfect. Like you've probably gone even harder than I have to get to where you were, to be the best football player in the world. Like the, how hard have you had to work to do it? Now, I know that the money incentive on that side is massive as well, but they are still the best people in the world. And this is why <laughs> when you get into sport and like somebody that we used to watch on, and like I'm sure every sports person probably mentioned it at some stage is the whole Lance Armstrong thing you know like I, I've watched the documentaries and stuff like that and I'm just like damn it you know like we all because at the time you were just like man this guy's a beast nah there's no way he's on drugs there's all this and, and we were athletes like going to the Olympics and you're watching you know early 2000s and stuff racing the Tour de France the biggest sporting event in the world you know and you're just like far out this guy's amazing and then of course okay bubble gets burst but but he was still the best athlete in a doped up sport. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But to be the best cyclist in the world is unbelievably hard. It is the most, like, it is so brutal to get to be that person that can win the Tour de France. You've got to be the best in the team. You've got to be the best in, like, thousands and thousands of riders around the world that try and make it to the top. And it's, but it's their sport. They're trying to do it. They're trying to be the best in the world. And they just give their whole lives to it. And they just knuckle down and do exactly what they have to, to be the best in the world. Which is why, uh, which is why I think it, it would be better if none of them were on drugs. Like, you know, oh. I mean? like it would even itself yeah. out. And, and yeah. it's, I, I, cause I was, I was, I must admit, I was, Eric, I never, I was never a big fan of Lance Armstrong. Like, I remember the hoo-ha, but then I remember when the drugs came out and I was like, that hey, motherfucker. Like, because I'm a clean athlete yeah. and uh, not that I'm competing with any, but like for my own, you know, moral fiber. Yeah, um, I think I, re I think Hamish took it hard, eh? Because he's such a cyclist fan. He was always in like cycling hard. But it would also be interesting to hear from like a, a, a passionate cycling person's point of view about when the bubble burst, you know, and how they felt. Because they would have been like, man, I ride every Sunday and I race in these races and then literally the best person in the world has just turned out to be a fraud. And you're like, fuck, that makes our sport look like shit. You know what I mean? And so yeah, yeah. I'd be interested to see the passionate person that was in the pro, like there, how they actually felt about it. Well, the, so I, I'm not sure how they, how they received in New Zealand, Eric, but like in Australia, cyclists, particularly in Melbourne, are disliked. I, I personally, I, I, I had done some cycling, so I, I have no issue with them, but like car drivers <laughs> fucking hate them. <laughs> they like, oh, wow. like, see your sport was shit. You know, you, and your mate Lance was a cheating motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, man, crazy. I, I'd love to know, Eric, if you've ever had any 
really shitty moments in your life where when you're going to hand it all in or just shit got too big uh, surely it happened okay um hold that thought i'm just going to take a leak and then i'll be back is that right <laughs> yeah. yeah mate there it is all good no worries no worries no yeah there we go so um so i'd love to know eric what about your rock bottom? Have you had one? Um, nah, so only a couple. The rock bottoms really are only um, uh, like when you're in the train, like when you, when you don't get to where you feel like you should be good enough, um, you just start to think, shit, am I actually going to be able to get there? So we had a couple of like 2006, we had a we were we won a World Cup medal and so we were like okay actually we're not going too bad um, and then we had the screwed up semi final where we didn't even the problem is we thought we were good enough to be in the final and we were too busy thinking about what's going to happen in the final you know so we we were good enough to be there but then we got this really hard semi final race and we missed out on the final and it was this stupid dead heat and we had to re race the race and so you finish it and you go man I've done all this training for the last few years and I've gone from getting uh, like fifth at the Olympics, then fifth at the world champs. And now you're getting like ninth and you go, is this really worth it? You know, and the funding's like not basically keeping you above water and all this other bits and pieces. So it starts getting really difficult on how you're going to be able to continue doing it. Um, and so that was probably one of the ones I knew that I changed some things when we came back. I didn't like how the program was running. And there was a group of us just went back with a bit more renewed energy to train slightly differently. Um, and then we got back into the team, won the world champs. And then in 2008, we went on to the Olympics and we got fourth in our semi-final. We're in the final. So you've worked all these four years and you're just sitting there on the finish line going, fuck. Like, and you're just emotional wreck. You're just like, this sucks, balls. And then you've got to go out <laughs> and race a B final the next day for ranking and you're just like oh my god and so that's really hard that 24 hours is fucking brutal in your mind because like you all you want to do is go buy the box of beers get on the you know like just drown your sorrows because you've just worked for this four-year period and it's all gone like there's no possibility of you getting it and you're just like man all the shit I've done, living on your bones, your ass, doing all this stuff to get to that point. And you go, ah, oh, I'm out. You know, like literally, I can't keep doing it, you know, because you just can't keep doing it. Um, and so there's only so far that like your partners and stuff can take where they, you're the one doing all your shit and their money is basically paying you to do your sport. And so it's a really, really tough place to be. And so, of course, you're not just pulling the pin for yourself. You could be pulling the pin because you're married or you've got kids and all this sort of stuff. But there does come that point in time. Um, but the opportunity, I took time and I stepped away and I evaluated all the stuff and I was ready to just go, you know what, I don't, I just want to have a break. It might be a year. I don't think I've finished, but whatever. And then it was literally Hamish coming to me like just after Christmas going, you want to go, you know, I have a nudge at the pier. And I went, fuck, what an amazing opportunity. And so then your whole plans change again. And it was like, right. <laughs> I'm right into this world again, getting knuckled down. And you're basically, because what you don't realize is that you're not just signing up for the next nine months of training. You're signing up for four years. You don't just sign up to go to the next world champs. When you go into it, you go, I'm on a four year mission and this is what's going to happen in this four years. My life's going to be here. I'm going to be training six days a week. I'm going to be going overseas this time and this time. Everyone else works around me and I'm just going to try and get to that point. Um, and so it's just trying to pick yourself up out of those. Um, I was just lucky that I had, because like if Hamish and I never had got on the pair together, you know, it was just an opportunity that at the time was just phenomenal to get hold of. And we knew we were both good at what we were doing. And so when you put that together, all of a sudden you've got the two people that think they're the fastest, they work the hardest, um, they do the best numbers and you put them together and all of a sudden, you've got something that's going to work. And we just worked and it just created like this amazing streak. And like, 
all the stupid victories and the times and every single record that we ever set was just because both of us, what we were talking about before about you as a person trying to be the best every single day and trying to grow up from that. You get two people that collide like this in a partnership, bang. And it's it. You know, you just get this phenomenal group of people. And that was what Hamish and I were. And we just did something that was like far beyond words. And are you two best mates as a result of this? <laughs> so you could do this in two questions, okay? Um, and I'll do them for you. Did you guys ever have an argument? <laughs> okay. Now, people, so we you got to remember, we lived together. When we went overseas, there was no hotels, you know, galore, and everyone's got their own suite and shit. We were in single, like, rooms, tiny room, bed slightly apart, living together in a training camp environment for three months, okay? And then we'd come back, and we were sweating on each other, rowing on each other for, <laughs> like, five, six hours a day, okay? Never, ever, re never had an argument. Never, really? ever had an argument. We had a couple of times where I thought Hamish was being a little bit too far. And I was like, come on, man, just fuck, you know, like, but we never had an argument. Okay. And there were two, there's a couple of things around that because what I said before about both of us trying to be the best, we, that's what we did every day against one another. And so all of a sudden you just get the respect from one another that, Hey, we sit on the row machine next to everyone else in the program. Hamish and I are number one and two, and everyone else is down here, you know? So all of a sudden, he just knows that we're clear from everybody else. He's got the best people we can work with. So me and Hamish are together, and it's just going to go into this thing that goes. Um, I'm completely different than Hamish. Like, we are chalk and cheese. And so the basic thing about it was that I'm really good friends with Hamish, and I trusted him with fucking doing everything he possibly could. Um, and, and that's what was created. Would I say we're mates? It's a different fine line because what we did was that we didn't live in each other's pockets. So if you were living together, oh, let's go to the pub, let's go to a cafe and all this sort of stuff. If stuff had started going like this, all of a sudden the person that you're socializing with, uh, doing everything, um, if the boat starts going really badly, all of a sudden, like, man, you can get a lot of tension and just partnerships will just erupt and be gone. So we made sure it was very sort of strictly professional. Like we still socialized on occasions, but it was like, I had my life, Hamish had his life. And we just, as soon as we left training, we left everything, all the sweat on the floor, and then we were out. And then we'd come back together and we'd both work with that one goal going forward. So we never, ever had to question one another's trust. Like Hamish never had to question my ethics. I never had to do the same to Hamish because he knew whatever was put in front of us, I'd do. And I knew whatever Hamish got, uh, he'd do. And so there was just no trust issues at all. And so when we raced or when we went as hard as we possibly could, all of a sudden we're just winning. And it's just because I'm giving my best. He's giving my best. You've taken two people who think they're amazing, put them together. Now you've got something that actually is going to go really fast. And that's really the combination and the way that we started and the way that we kept it all the way through. So 100% respect for Hamish. He's 100% he's a, a friend. Um, but we just, I think, living not in that whole really tight social mate circle um, probably made it really good so that we could just do our job. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting dynamic. It's kind of, kind of like, it reminds me of Torval and Dean almost. Mm. Um, and it, and it uh, makes me think of that incident that happened with the Australian women's uh, four. I think the eight. when one of the girls just laid oh, down. Oh, lay down Sally. Lay down Sally, 2004. What Do you know what, what happened there? <laughs> yeah, so this is a, um, anyone that remembers it, 2004, Athens. Um, she just stopped rowing with like about 100 metres to go. It uh, is a uh, mind blowing and like it is uh, like um, she had done it before. And so this is the problem that as a sports person, people saw it and went, oh, this poor girl, she does literally like ran out of gas. She tied up like a racehorse and, you know, the poor girl, oh, you know, look at her. And then anyone that's an athlete goes, ah, she's done it before. She was going to do it again. And of course, and you're just like, shit, like, 
And of course, if you're in a program where the coach is like, oh, we're going to keep putting Sally in and you keep turning around going, fuck, if we're in a race today, is she going to lay down? Is she going to stop? And she'll just like take the pressure off. And it's just like, you've got to get those people out. But of course, the coach won't get them out The because if she does testing, she could probably still win. And you're like, oh man, like, and so as an athlete, you're trying to win an Olympic gold medal <laughs> and you've got this person that you can't even trust and you have to do it with them. Like, oh my God, I don't know how the hell anyone would be able to do that because you just know that if they're like, it's no different than with just normal sports or business, anything like that. People that just continuously turn up late or they just leave early all the time, then they're, they're not there. Like they don't, and it's the same in sport. This just goes to like an nth degree where you're just like, man, this is going to be like detriment. We could be in the Olympic final and this happens. And guess what happens? Like, oh, it's a shocker. It's a massive shocker. I, I, I'd be, I'm going to do some more investigating after this to find out um, what her life has been like since that, because it, I, I think it would be really hard to come back from that. She, she tried to keep rowing, eh? Oh, I know. I know. And I just feel for her because, man, I would be, it's something that, you know, like <laughs> when, when <laughs> you, all the historical victories, you know, like the Kathy Freeman running the 400, you know, Michael Johnson's or the Usain Bolt, you know, all the things that you've seen in history, there's all those obscure ones where, oh, that's right. That fucking happened. And of course you're forever etched. It's like, um, what's the guy, Stephen, is it Stephen someone? The guy Bradbury. in the ice, the ice skating. Stephen okay? Bradbury, yeah. He is remembered for that race. Okay, it's still he won, but it would never have been that massive if it hadn't for been the circumstances that it happened. So, of course, this poor girl in the rowing, she's gone down in history as the, oh, the rowing girl that laid down. And it's like, man, what does that do to your head? You know, like it's, it's a, oh, oh, it's a hard place to be, man. What, well, what is the natural thing to do if you are overcooked in rowing? Like, what have you, do you vomit? Do you pass out? Like... What no, happens? but this is this is where your training goes. So even if you are at absolute max, you should still be able to keep everything going. Okay, and if and the one thing with it as well is that you know where the limits are. So when things like that happen, you just crack. Because I know how hard I could go. I know if we were just doing repeat pieces, how hard you could go, and you would go until you literally just were like I can't do it, and and you were like I'm I'm a hundred percent gassed, and you'd give it everything you possibly could. And because that's just what you did, you never quit. But of course, there are people around that just, when the going gets tough, they'll just back off slightly, you know, and it just, and that's what happens. But um, to go further than that, it's just something's hit and you've just gone, oh, oh, yeah, it's, it just doesn't really make sense. Like as an elite athlete, if you're quitting on different races and stuff like that, you're just not well enough to prepare. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's fascinating. Like you look at some of the examples in sport where people uh, like in cricket, like they've got a, um, who was the new, the black cat in the last couple of years who was batting on with a broken arm or a broken hand, like facing bounces oh, and shit. Like, like it's just, and that's, and that's just, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't pull out unless you're on your deathbed uh, no. just because you don't want to let people down. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sports are funny one. They, eh? um, you know, and, and there's so many different things that have happened. And that's why, like, I've, as I say, I, I got into sport because I loved it, you know, and I still watch a lot of stuff and, and really enjoy it. I love playing golf, man. I love golf. Um, and, and it's just really enjoyable. And so no different. The, the things that I do now, though, is that I take into account that I'm a pretty shit golfer. I'm not bad, but the fact is that I've come from being like absolute uh, the top of the pops and now you come back into a sport and everyone's like, oh, you're going to be the best. And you've got to be like, no, no, I know my, like, I know how good I am right now and I'm not that good. And so I can really accept it and go for it um, because what I learned with my sport is I knew what I was capable of achieving and then I could just go out and do it. So you turn up on the Olympic final and you know that you can race a certain time because you've done it a week prior. Um, a lot of people that turn up to like these big events, generally, if they go, oh, I'm not sure how it's going to go they probably haven't, they don't know how fast they're going. Or if they do, it's not as fast as it needs to be. 
And that's the biggest thing that we knew with all our races going into them. We like I could tell you all the really close races we had because we hadn't prepared well going into them. You know, we either had injuries or um, you know, Bondi used to get stress fractures. There was one World Cup that we won, and I was watching it the other day, and we only won by like less than a second. And I was just like, oh, that's right. We'd only rode for like three days before the race. Um, we'd given the guys a bit of a hiding, you know, like four weeks prior. But the fact was, next, all of a sudden, they're like right beside us. And I'm like, I don't think we can go any faster. You know, like this is where we're at. And shit, if we win this, we'll be doing really well. But I knew that that was all we were capable of doing that right then because of the preparation that we had put in. Um, and that's basically just the way that sport works. And if you can do that properly, no matter what sport you're doing, you're always going to probably be the people that win. Do you use the same philosophy for life in general, Aaron? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, because as long as you're in the position that you want to be or working towards what you're trying to do, you've got the, the vision and you've got to where you want to go. Um, and if you start doing goal settings, I find that I'm probably doing more now than I was doing in terms of rowing. So, you know, now I'm just like, I've renovated a property in, in town as well as like doing all my business stuff and everything else. And I'm like, I really enjoy that. Like maybe I'll do another one, you know? And so that sort of becomes your hobby and you start looking at that. And then you're like, man, I'd love to do this. And, and I'm doing stuff with Zach. So I'm like, okay, well, what are you going to do with him? So your life starts revolving around that rather than revolving around like what you used to do with the sport, but you use the same philosophies moving forward to just put everything into everything you're doing and always have the great outlook on if you take that path and that's where you dive into, no matter what it is in life, if you dive into that, you just have to accept the outcome. Um, you know, And if it works for you, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. The path's just going to go on a different direction. Um, and that was basically what I do now. So if you just dive into something, yeah, well, I'm going to have fun doing this. I'm going to get to it because that's what I did for so many years with rowing is I just dived my whole life into it. But I had a, I loved every moment of like the camaraderie and all the bits and pieces and the journey to get to that point, because that's what I like. I enjoyed it was hard. But when I look back on it, I flourished like I loved it. You know, when you could beat your targets and stuff like that, you actually look back on it. And even though you're just you're always hammered and you're just so tired, when you look back on it, you were just like, you know what? I can look back at Eric Murray five years ago and be proud of what he did every single day. And the way that he went out about it and just went as hard as he could to get to that point and get to that point. So this is basically what you've got to do in life. Like if you're just working with your kids, just go 100% with them and just do everything you can to make that happen. Or if you're trying to be better at another sport or if you're trying to lose weight or if you're trying to quit smoking or anything like that, you just got to dive into it and just commit to it and just really get stuck in behind it. Um, and it's the only way that you can do it is unless like your life starts revolving around that particular thing, you're just not going to be able to give it as much as you want. And this is why you hear a lot of people just going, I just feel sort of headless because I'm doing half ass things everywhere and they're not really enjoying doing any of it. It just becomes part of their life. Whereas they could be like, I'll quit these three things that I'm doing, just do one thing and then just really enjoy doing that is, you know, whether shit you go biking in the weekends or you play social netball or you do whatever it is you play golf um that's what you do and that's what you do for fun and that's what you do for your mental break from your job from your relationships whatever it might be that's what keeps you healthy and i think a lot of people just don't have that you know they don't have like what where am i going to go where am i going to take this you know should i renovate my house and try and add 100 grand and then do it again and do it again and do it again you know or am I going to have my kids or am I going to start up a small business? Am I going to look at doing something? Um, you know, these are the types of things. Or if, even if you're like, you know what, I've made good money in business. You know, I came straight out of a school as an accountant or lawyer, made heaps of money. And now you're just sitting there going, you know, but I hate living in fucking Auckland. It sucks. <laughs> um, no, but then you go, you know, why don't I can still work as a lawyer two days a week from home and go live in Raglan or go down and live in Queenstown or somewhere like that. And so, those are the types of things you just got to make the decisions. And if that's the way that you go, you just accept what happens. But if it makes you feel better, if it makes you healthy, um, you just have to do it. Um, and that's just part of life. It's just fully part of life and it's fully what we do. Well, your, your energy is infectious. 
It really is. And, and <laughs> even before we had an opportunity to speak, like in, in going over some of the old footage uh, from your races, I this morning I went and ran a half marathon distance um, because of like the, I was like, fuck, you know, this guy's a badass. I'm going to have to pull my socks up here. <laughs> and it's not like I haven't run that far before, but it was like, I haven't run that distance for about six months. And, um, and I, and I, and I feel awesome as a result, you know, mm. like, and so, so I, I'm, for that, I'm really grateful. One thing I'd love to know, I, I know someone watching this right now is having a tough, t- tough time of it. And I'd love to know your thoughts on what they could do right now to improve their own situation. Oh man. It's, I, I sort of hate commenting on it because, um, I, the biggest thing around when you think about it is you only know what like having a bad time is in somebody's life if you actually had it happen to you before. Do you know what I mean? So like people could have just lost their job. You know, they might have just separated from their wife or whatever and the kids, you know, they're going through custody battles. They're like gone on to the jobs, you know, and all of this. And you're just like, shit, like, man, what what are you doing? You're, you're applying for jobs. Nothing's happening, whatever. Like I've never been in that situation. And so I don't know really what to, to I, if I could give anything that would say like, just snap out of it or whatever. Cause it doesn't, it's not like that. But if I, if I could get anywhere near that, it's just like, okay, where do I go to get out of this? And even if you don't have a job, it's like, okay, could I actually be coming really fit? Could I actually change my habits? Okay. There's no more takeaways. There's no more shit food. I'm actually going to get on the internet and I'm going to start cooking fresh fruit and veggies every day because it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be good for us. We'll change our lifestyle. We're going to feel better. I'm going to sleep better. Um, whatever and then that could lead you into something else and then the next thing and then the next thing but it's just putting those little things in front of you and just saying well maybe I just do it a lot of those things doesn't cost you any money to do it but it's just a different change in lifestyle that you might need okay and it's just the only way to do it so the like with me um, you know when you leave rowing you've you know there's something to go out to afterwards some people don't and that's where the whole mental health side goes away especially with a lot of elite athletes. But if you move outside of it and you realize that you're not going to be living to that level of stress and anxiety under like performing every single day, and you just got to bring that back into a focus of working in an environment with other people, you already know how to do it. Um, you, you can just elevate and just take all of that sort of stress and anxiety away from you from that. Um, and that's the thing you just got to work towards is going, it's not a huge change, just little things in my life that might make it actually better um, and ultimately can make you happier because you can't do huge changes in one go. Um, you just got to keep working on little things to just see where you can get out of it. But you just got to keep working on it. And it's like, as I say, the pathway that it's going to take you, it could be quite short. It could be long. Um, you just have to accept that it could be a three or four year journey out of it, you know, um, no different than the Olympics. It's a four-year journey. You don't get there. You can't just turn up a couple of months before and go, hey, I'd love to win the Olympics now. <laughs> um, you know, I know that, that getting in hard times is quite negative, but that's the thing with the Olympics. You know, even sporting stuff, it is really negative on people. Um, and you just have to turn what you were doing into another, another direction and just move that way. Yeah, I think... It- I'd, I'd be careful not to diminish your own experiences, Eric. It's, it's I understand that where you're coming from. I think there's a lot of really sage advice in there. And I think, you know, if someone asked me a similar question, it would be to, to avoid taking a victim mentality to anything, mm. just little things that, that, you know, because of this amazing bubble that you've been in, you probably, it, this is a, this is a no brainer for you. You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a victim. You know, I'd take ownership of what's happened. And I think that's the kind of stuff that, that a lot of people are really struggling with. They feel like the world's against them from a lot of the stuff that I've seen. And I used to be like that before I got my shit sorted until I took ownership for what had happened to me and, and used it as my fuel and my superpower. So I, it's sort of two different angles we're coming from here, but we end up in the same place, I think which is really great. And, uh, and again, like you, you just, the energy that you bring is infectious. And I think it'll have an impact on people watching this, you know, whatever your trial or tribulation that, that you're going through. 
Yeah, no, no, and it and it is. Um, you know, I you only ever wish the best for people. Um, you know, I've come from. Uh, I've learned a lot of respect in my time, and a, in a part of like with being an athlete is that you have to respect everybody that's turning up to doing to race you, because they're not just there to make up numbers. They're trying to be you from somewhere else around the world. They're trying to be the fastest in the world, and it's just someone on a different continent doing the same sport out of the seven billion people floating around on this bloody piece of piece of uh, uh, space rock in the universe. It's me, you know, and, and you sort of go down into it and you're just like, you know, but it all fits in the big piece of puzzle, um, you know, and it is. It's just a, a matter of putting your piece where it's going to be um, and just taking that where you can. And so, yeah, I, I've always just tried to have a positive outlook on life. And if things haven't even gone my way or you miss out on something or you don't have enough money for this or you lose your job for that, you just got to keep getting back up and just keep moving forward um, and just keep looking into the long term and know that things don't just happen overnight. They just, they're just a progression getting you further forward and, and seeing where it can take you. Did you have any moments with Zach where you were angry at the world for, for this autistic diagnosis oh mate you can go through so many different emotions but um in the end you've got a beautiful healthy kid who is just slightly a little bit different and that's different in society's terms so um no you know you just go whatever happens happens um and I, and i have been sort of quite i've always been the optimistic person where things happen because they just happen, you know, and it's like, you can be walking out and you fall down the stairs, you know, nobody bloody knows, it just happens. Um, and this is just another thing, you know, it's, it can be why uh, kids are deaf or blind or whatever it might be. It's just, that's, that's just what happened at that time, um, you know, and that's what happens with kids or that just what happens with life in terms of uh, the direction you go or the choices that you make. Um, I'm a massive fan of choices. You know, you choose to, drink and drive you'll kill yourself you know you choose to to get onto drugs or whatever that's what you know you can go down a deep alleyway um but if you choose to do different things um ultimately they will take you to where you want to go and to the happiness that you can find i really i love that eric and i and i'm i'm very respectful that you are a very busy man so i won't <laughs> hold you up much longer but i'd love for you to share with us and our audience your favorite rowing story oh mate okay i've got a couple of this cut okay so probably the best rowing story is it's probably the moment and i i do talk about because it's actually a race um that i i would say i lost my sportsmanship um <laughs> uh good. yeah and and i did and i did and i look back on it and i'm like oh shit and a lot of people talk about it you know and, and it keeps getting brought up every now and again so we had the world champs here in Carapiro. So this is a sort of a two-part story. We had the world champs here at Carapiro and we raced, we were meant to win. Um, we came down the, the racing track and shit, we're behind. Shit, we're still behind at the thousand. Man, we're three quarters of a length down at the 500 to go. And Hamish told me afterwards, he goes about 400 meters to go, which is just before I made the call to like, I can, got to hit top speed. Um, he was basically writing his, um, obituary to the media in his head he was like man what am i going to say to the media when they go oh you know the british beat you today and i was like oh shit so like this i i afterwards i like shit but the fact was that we hit the line um we hit like 300 meters to go we hit top speed and we won by like a foot and it was the closest race we ever had in the whole time we ever raced the pair and we nearly got it screwed up on our home water when we should have been like firing on all hundred cylinders, but these guys came with their A game and nearly like took us off of their head. Um, it was an amazing thing to happen. So that's one of my most memorable. So if you talk about stories, that's probably most my memorable moment. But the other one was after that race, the first time we met the British again, and you're talking the top two guys in the British program, the ones getting all the money, the top and the testing, everything. And Great Britain is like number one in the world for rowing. Hmm. And we keep beating them. And so we turn up to this Lucerne regatta and the media just comes at you going, oh, yeah, the British are going to beat you. They're being so fast. Their training times are better than ever. And you're just like, man, I, this is motivating me to like destroy them. And so basically 
the commentator was coming up to us going, oh, and he's going, and I said, I'm going to fucking smash them. Like, it was, it was like that. And so we raced the race. We came out in front. And I watched the race afterwards on commentary, and I still watch it now. And the commentator's like, you know, I'm pretty sure the British are going to lead, um, and it's going to be really close, you know, like this. And then um, he said, they'll lead by the 500. And we were like three quarters of a length in, the, in front of them by the 500. And he goes, this is not how the British should be racing, you know, and he was giving it all. So we raced, and we just kept the hammer down as hard as we could to all the way to the line. We went through the line and we were about seven and a half seconds, like the biggest victory we've ever put over these guys. So we crossed the finish line and I pulled out the imaginary binoculars like this going like, where are you? And of course, and so people, there's photos everywhere of me just doing this on every rowing forum around the world, just like Murray giving the binoculars. And it was like, oh shit. Like it was so funny because of what I did, but I felt so bad about it afterwards. And of course, when the commentator like is doing it, and we watch the like the rowing like in a couple of days later, um, there he goes, "Oh, there's Murray, all the talk that all the media's been giving you." So he knew exactly what I was doing, but it's just like the probably the it's a funny story. But I just always look back on it, going, "Man, your sportsmanship was right on the line there, buddy." Even though it was tongue in cheek, it was still like quite arrogant, and it was just something that we never were. But yeah, mate. Apart from that, there's not too many like gruesome party out stories because we never actually went out and did too much all overseas eh? yeah oh, I love that uh, I, I would say given what's gone on in world sport over the last few years I would say that's pretty vanilla and very acceptable in my humble opinion you certainly didn't have any sandpaper in your pocket yeah there we go there you so, go um, and what's what's next for Eric Murray what's happening in your world right now in your five-year plan Oh, mate, five-year plan. I'm uh, going to finish the renovation on my place. Um, that's been keeping me busy. Uh, I work business development with Concept2. So we've, uh, mate, we've been going crazy with like COVID and, and everything. Uh, and then on the side of that, I work with an app development company called Asensei. And so we work on like a coaching program that you can use on your own machine. Uh, and then I'm patron for Autism New Zealand. And then... I've still been working a little bit with like the ANZ on their Olympic sponsorship and bits and pieces. Then I've got my boy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so always doing stuff with him, school, bits and pieces, trying to play a bit of golf. So yeah, everything's actually just there in terms of where I want to be with my place. Bloody enjoying renovating. Love it. I did six months worth of renovations and bloody um, and four and uh, six months worth of renovations in four weeks over lockdown level four here, eh? <laughs> While everybody went to that, while everybody went to the supermarkets to buy like loo paper, I went straight to uh, Mitre Ten and just bought up like thousands of dollars worth of timber and all the paint I could carry, just literally because I knew that we were going to be doing nothing. And then of course everybody seen it at home going, I've got nothing to do, and we're coming into like our late summer autumn, um, and everyone's just like, shit, I should have bought some paint should have done something with the inside of the house. And so they're sitting around with their kids like going stir crazy because they're not allowed to go anywhere. Um, and here's me like <laughs> sawing out walls, ripping off wallpaper, painting, going hard. And it was so much fun. I actually really enjoyed my time. So um, that's going to be a bit going forward. And yeah, just general life, man. Just doing the best you can. Well, this, this has been a real pleasant surprise, uh, Eric. I, I didn't know a lot about you before I was uh introduced by a couple of people and and i am incredibly motivated by your energy and your optimistic nature your enthusiasm for life and your just go at it i really fucking love it and i'm gonna go run some more tomorrow morning i um, do it and uh just wanted to thank you for your time today ladies and gentlemen Thanks, eric murray <laughs>